You know, when I think about reimagining healthcare, I don't start with the future. I start with the past. I'm gonna tell you a little story about how I first came to decide to be a, a doctor. It's a story that probably a lot of people who've become doctors share. I was about 12 years old, and I had a stomach flu. And I was very uncomfortable, and so my mom called my family physician, who, within half an hour, had driven over to my house, and he had come with everything that was needed. Dr. Leonard Shafton, truly an amazing man, and the Amazon of his time. Because in his bag, he had a thermometer, some Tylenol, some warm, flat Coke to spoon feed me, and an inexhaustible supply of compassion. And he sat there, and he took care of me. And by the time he was done, 20 minutes later, I was back resting and getting ready to go to sleep in my bed. And then I felt better the next day. And so when he called my home to just double check and make sure my recovery was on track, he was satisfied. He knew I was better. Right. Isn't that what we all want when we're sick? Isn't that what we want to do, right? Going back to the future, basically, right? Is figuring out how to master technology and the digital transformation to deliver that level of care, concern, and personalized treatment. Now, I was in awe back then. I'm in awe still today of the caring and incredibly hardworking nurses and doctors and others in our healthcare system who try and do that every day, but have not yet been equipped with the right tools to do it. So I want to talk a little bit about what those tools are, what they look like today, what they could look like today, and how we're going to deliver tomorrow's healthcare today. So first, I'm going to talk about something that happened well, a couple weeks ago. We're in the middle of the flu season, and I'm a pretty savvy consumer of healthcare, but um, unfortunately, I was off that day. And so I got called by a friend who was sick and said, I think I have the flu. I need you to help me. And I'm like, OK, fine. And so I got in my car. I drove them to urgent care and where they had their flu test and their COVID test. And uh, in so doing, of course, I exposed myself to infectious diseases. I exposed the people, or my friend exposed everybody in the clinic waiting area and the people taking care of them. And then they got to go back home. And I took on my dutiful role to track down the electronically prescribed prescription uh, for the uh, single drug that's called Tamiflu that actually treats the flu. And I went to the drugstore where it had been called in, and they were out of it. And I'm like, oh, OK. And then they said, don't worry. We, we're going to forward the prescription to a, to a store that has it. It's just a few miles down the road. And I'm like, OK. So I get back in my car, and I drive, and I get there, and I get into the pharmacy. And sure enough, they have the drug. They give it to me. This is wonderful. And and, and I go to the aisles, and I'm thinking, OK, well, they're probably going to need some Tylenol and a thermometer and maybe some mentholated chest rub and some cough drops and you know, some multi-symptom NyQuil-type drug to, to make them OK. And of course, that drugstore is out of half of that stuff. And so then I get in my car, and I drive to the third drugstore. And I finally fill out my little basket. And I get back, and four hours after this odyssey started, Four hours later, and like I said, I'm a fairly savvy consumer of healthcare, finally got that person what they really needed in their bed, symptomatic relief, and on the way to recovery. Why did it take four hours? I could have sushi at my door in 10 minutes. <laughs> I could have sushi if I was customizing it in maybe 25 minutes. Why did it take four hours to get the only drug that would possibly pres be prescribed in this situation and a package of goods that every single person suffering from the flu needs. Why isn't the checklist like jalapenos and bacon on my pizza? How hard could that be? As a matter of fact, it's not hard at all because I check off jalapeno and bacon on my pizza and it shows up at my door in 15 minutes. Why don't we do that? We have all the capabilities we currently need to do that. 30% of all tasks in healthcare can be automated today, like that. But you don't need to see the doctor. My friend had all the classic symptoms. They were going to get prescribed this drug. Why did we need to go through that? We probably didn't. And that's the whole point. So number one is we need to, it doesn't take that much to reimagine that we could have an Amazon-like experience from our healthcare services. It's doable today. 
All we would need is a handshake agreement that when I send a prescription over to a pharmacy, they look in their stock, which they know if they have it or not, and they just tell us before we drive over there. What stands in the way of this? Us. We don't demand it. We're not demanding enough to say, you know what, that level of convenience when we're sick is even more important than I'm waiting for my sushi. Right? Okay. So, what else are we doing about managing our illnesses and our wellness that we are not really taking advantage of? For instance, I have a watch. It's one of those watches that measures sleep cycles, heart rate, blood oxygen content, how much I exercise, am I steady on my feet, is my heartbeat irregular? I mean, it's a basically walking doctor helper. But we, two out of the three of us would like our care teams to consider the data we're collecting, but we don't. And you may say, well, why, why, why don't we? Because it's, it's too hard. But I want to take you to tomorrow's healthcare. I'm going to start with a sci-fi movie. Everybody's, right, uh, seen Star Wars, right? Everybody seen Star Wars? Oh, yeah, okay. I mean, right, who doesn't like Star Wars, right? Luke Skywalker hops in his vintage World War II looking fighter and flies it into outer space. But he doesn't fly it into outer space by himself. He has R2-D2 sitting right behind him. His little head whirring around, right? And every time something happens, like he's off, off orbit or the trajectory has got to change or there's dangerous fighters coming from his blind side or the battery or the gun is jamming and then he, you know, he, he, he lets Luke know all this so that the mission is completed, so that Luke can concentrate on the mission. Well, our doctors don't have R2-D2 sitting in their back pocket, but they should. They can. As a matter of fact, if, unless you've had your head in the sand for a, the last two months, you know that AI is, you know, is in everything we're doing. It's been that way in healthcare quite some time as we think about how we master that technology, how we get computers to be the R2-D2 that we need to take care of all that incoming data and just alert us when we need to know right, that Empire Starfighter's coming at us. But as long as they're not, R2-D2 doesn't have to say anything. He's still monitoring that 360-degree view. That's what AI does tomorrow, today. Today's healthcare, tomorrow, tomorrow's healthcare, today. Yes, both of those. That's what we're doing when we employ these computer-driven algorithms and uh, to tell us what's going on. And just to give you an idea, so I'll give you some clear examples. Um, I had a uh, someone check out my heart rate, normally healthy person, they're just doing some unnecessarily invasive test or whatever, but it wasn't that invasive. It was a little button, size of a quarter, just stuck it on my chest, put a little bandage over it, like a little clear bandage, you know, like a Band-Aid thing. And yes, I could take showers for a week. And it downloaded almost a million heartbeats. A million heartbeats. What doctor is gonna go through a million heartbeats? But luckily, the computer-generated analysis of the pattern of my heartbeats identified that out of that almost one million heartbeats, I had four that were abnormal. This is almost in real time. I sent the little device to the company. They put it through the computer. They let, sent me back a thing saying, you only have four abnormal heartbeats. And they showed them to my cardiologist at the same moment so that he, could, he didn't have to go through a million heartbeats. He just got the four that were abnormal. He didn't need to look at the 996,000, whatever, 96 that were normal, right? Because that's low value work. It's low value work to do repetitive tasks that don't need to be done by a care team member. It's low value to look at things that you know are normal. It's high value to look at things that may be abnormal that require a discussion with a patient. And that's what happened. The cardiologist got the information. He called me up, he said, I looked at your four heartbeats, they're fine, okay. It wasn't free, but it was, it was rewarding in its own way. <laughs> yeah, that, and, and I'm good, and I, I like that, you know? And um, getting rid, that is what we're trying to do. The high value work, right, is talking to people, is working with them, making joint decisions about, you know, do they need a further workup? Do they want to not do something? That's high value work from professionals. Going through almost a million normal heartbeats, that's low value work. And so that's what computers can relieve. And that low value work is what drives frontline provider burnout. If you ask them what's the top thing that makes them want to leave their job is because a lot of the work they do every day isn't really necessary. 
I mean, nurses spend more than 50% of their time doing chart work in electronic medical records, not taking care of people. OK, so how else can you use little things like this? You know, you can imagine, because you don't have to imagine too much, because we're going to start doing this this month, um, where we'd send people home from the hospital who might not be on a perfect course of recovery, rather than having to call everyone up every single minute, right? This, will, this little thing will transmit eight different vital signs and 1,440 times a day. Now, that's 10,000, more than 10,000 data points each day. What doctor or nurse is going to examine 10,000 data points? It's like my million heartbeats. Can't do it. But if you have a computer analyzing it and saying, ha, huh, this pattern seems to predict that someone might have a bad recovery, this pattern says they're fine, they're, they're, they're recovering fine, just like when my doctor called me. Right? And he said, how are you doing? And I said, fine. He said, ah, your recovery's on track. We can do that now with 10,000 data points a day. That's thinking about the future. We just have to link it back to our electronic medical record, medical record so it all integrates. Oh, wait, we've done that. That's, that's rolling out next month. And the reason is, and we're not the only ones doing this, this is the future. You can't do it by hand, and you don't even want to do it by hand because so much of it is normal. You want to do care by exception. You want to know if you're not on the right pathway. And you want to do it without having to call every single person every single day, right, 10 times a day in order to figure that out. So that's, that's where we're going with all of this. There's also the idea of pattern recognition. So not only looking at EKGs, but looking at things like mammograms, right? We all care about mammograms because we want them done. We want them done quickly with less discomfort. We want to know right away if there's a suspicious mass in there. We want to know. We don't want to suffer the anxiety of waiting. It's like I didn't have to suffer waiting to hear about my million heartbeats. Well, we can do that too. As a matter of fact, there's a recent study that showed that an AI-driven algorithm was more accurate than the best radiologists, and that with the radiologists working with the AI, they could cut the number of radiologists needed to read mammograms in half and get more accuracy. Wow. Now, you may say, well, what's that radiologist going to do? Because you have to worry about people who have trained and long. It's not worried. We don't have enough radiologists to read mammograms. One of the rate-limiting steps in getting everybody the mammogram they should have is we don't have enough professionals to read the mammograms. So this invention will actually allow everybody who should have a mammogram to have a mammogram without increasing the costs of professionals reading the films. So it is equity, because a lot of the people who don't get mammograms don't get it because they're in underserved communities and they don't, unfortunately, get to the front of the line. They should, but it's a different story and a different lecture. Um, and it's expensive, but it's not expensive if you don't increase labor costs. So we can increase mammograms without increasing labor costs. That's a great thing. Right? These are not bad things. These are, these are great things. Same thing with COPD patients. Right? Chronic lung disease patients, 30% of them are readmitted back to the hospital after they've been in the hospital for an exacerbation of their lung disease. Again, if you start attaching things like this little button to them and downloading 10,000 data points a day, you can figure out who you need to intervene with at an earlier time to preserve their wellness and their recovery and prevent them coming back to the hospital, which is a very expensive option. So I'm really thrilled that we are headed in this direction. There are two or three caveats I'm just going to touch on. Humans have to be in charge, OK? Just saying, right? If you haven't seen 2001 Space Odyssey or any of a number of other films, um, yeah, humans have to be in charge. And it's not going to occur as quickly as we would like because, thank goodness, that your doctors and your nurses are really conservative. They're really change averse, and you want them to be change averse because it's a big deal if we get it wrong, right? You can't just trust the computer. You've got to trust, but verify. And change will occur at the speed of trust. Stephen Covey Jr. said that. It's the absolute truth in healthcare. We have to prove to our colleagues that whatever programming and care by exception and all this other stuff, that it catches people at the right time and makes their health better and doesn't miss anybody. And that requires constant revalidation. So I just want to point out that, yes, it's a, it's any new technology comes with the need right, to evaluate its implementation extremely carefully, because our health can't be gotten back once it's lost. So we want to make sure we don't make any mistakes in this process. But I am really encouraged. I am not afraid of technology. I'm not afraid of data. I'm not afraid of computers. And I definitely have faith in our doctors and nurses to take control of the situation. And I'm just here to make it possible. And I want to say thank you very much for thinking about how to reimagine healthcare today. <laughs>